Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, over 100 Palestinians injured in continued violence in occupied East Jerusalem. At least 22 indigenous people wounded in armed attack in Colombia. Healthcare workers go on strike to demand a fair contract in the US. Organizations urge the US to uphold human rights conditions on military aid to Egypt. And in our video section, we take a look at the healthcare crisis in India amid a severe wave of COVID-19. In our first story, at least 105 Palestinians have been injured in attacks by Israeli forces and settlers in occupied East Jerusalem. Aid agency Red Crescent has reported that 22 injured people had to be hospitalized. According to local reports, Israeli police have arrested around 50 people, most of whom are Palestinian. The violence occurred as Palestinian worshippers were leaving the Al-Aqsa Mosque after special Ramadan prayers on April 22nd. Thursday's violence occurred following a march by hundreds of far-right anti-Arab protesters, led by the extremist Lehawa group, Chants of death to Arabs and to restore Jewish dignity could be heard during the march. Lehawa marchers also attacked Palestinian workers in the city's Mahane Yehuda market before moving towards the Damascus Gate. According to Israeli media, Lehawa had also asked its supporters to carry guns. As reported by Haritz, the marchers also assaulted left-wing activists gathered at Zion Square. Palestinians have been met with police violence in the Damascus Gate area since the start of Ramadan on April 13th. Worshippers have been routinely gathering here following prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. However, Israeli police set up barriers in the area last week, barring Palestinians from sitting there. Multiple incidents of settler and police violence have been reported from the area since then. Palestinians have been attacked with stun grenades in what is called skunk water through water cannons. Delivered in Israel, it's a malodorant deployed, deployed as a dispersal tactic. Several indigenous people were wounded in an armed attack in Colombia on April 22nd. The National Indigenous Organization of Colombia, ONIC, reported that the attack took place in the Cauca department. The Regional Indigenous Council later confirmed that 22 people had been wounded. The attacks took place in the ancestral La Laguna, Siberia territory of members of an indigenous Minga. As reported by ONIC, they were taking part in a collective action to eradicate illicit coca crops from the land. It was then that seven gunshots were heard. It was later confirmed that among those injured were traditional authorities, indigenous guards and community members. Thursday's attack took place just days after the assassination of indigenous leader Sandra Liliana Pena. She had been the governor of the indigenous La Laguna Siberia Reservation. According to local media, she was shot by armed men who had come to her house. The Cauca Regional Indigenous Council stated that Pena died on her way to the hospital. As reported by Telesur, she had opposed the cultivation of cocoa crops in the region and its connection to illegal armed groups. Indigenous authorities have stated that she had received death threats for her actions. Thursday's indigenous Minga had been organized to denounce the assassination. This week's violence is the latest in a sustained campaign against indigenous people and social leaders in Colombia. According to Indipass, 53 social leaders and rights defenders have been killed so far in 2021 alone. In our next story, we go to the United States where hospital workers in the state of Pennsylvania went on strike this week. Workers at the Tyler Memorial Hospital announced a three-day strike starting April 21st. 84 employees of the rural hospital facility are represented by the Service Employees International Union. They have been mobilizing against unfair labor practices. As reported by WBRE, the workers' contracts ended on February 28th. Despite over four months of bargaining with the hospital's owner, Community Health Systems, no agreement has been reached. Workers have highlighted poor conditions of work, including low wages and old equipment. They have raised issues of safety, patient care and recruiting and retaining qualified staff. Workers have argued that while companies, the company made hundreds of millions of profit during the pandemic, none of the workers' concerns were taken seriously. They are demanding that the company use the $700 million it received in pandemic relief to improve patient care. They have also accused the hospital's management of negotiating in bad faith and have demanded a fair contract. The strike action has received support from the local community as well as lawmakers. Tyler Memorial is the only hospital within approximately 50 minutes of the community. We continue with the United States where several organizations are urging the country against removing human rights conditions on military aid to Egypt. The appeal has been made as part of a statement to the Joe Biden administration released on April 22nd. 14 organizations, including Amnesty International and Democracy for Arab World Now, or DAWN, have made the appeal. The US Congress places human rights conditionalities on parts of the $1.3 billion in military aid to Egypt. However, the administrations of Barack Obama and Donald Trump have used a national security waiver to bypass this. Thursday's statement has urged the Biden administration not to use a national security waiver against this. Doing so, the statement argues, would, to quote, continue the pattern of providing blank checks to the Egyptian government. The US government has also authorized $197 million in arms sales to Egypt earlier this year. Various organizations have documented the widespread human rights violations in Egypt under President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. These were also acknowledged by the US State Department in a report released last month. There have been reports of arbitrary killings, torture and serious restrictions on free speech and association. 
Rights groups have estimated that around 60,000 political prisoners are being held in jail. The inhumane conditions in Egyptian prisons were also documented in an amnesty report released in January. These include the denial of proper medical care, shortages of food and basic necessities, and prolonged solitary confinement. And in our final story, we go to India, which has recorded over 332,000 COVID cases in the 24 hours preceding Friday. The Health Ministry reported on April 23rd that 2,263 people had died in one day. Ten states accounted for 75% of the cases, with Maharashtra and Uttar Pradesh being the worst hit. India is facing a brutal wave amid mass shortages of oxygen, supplies and ICU beds across hospitals. Here is Dr. Satyajit Rath to talk more about the ongoing healthcare crisis. We are unprepared because we have built no long-term commitments to expanded healthcare facilities, particularly of critically ill people. We are unprepared because even something as fundamental as oxygen is in short supply. You know, we've been talking for the past year all sorts of things about, oh, new drugs and access to new drugs and whether, what is the utility of new drugs and what are the nuances of their use and so on and so forth. And we are short of oxygen. Added on top of that is the fact that while our national numbers are steadily rising at a constant acceleration, that is not driven by a few localized outbreaks. That is driven by a nationwide, all states rate of increase, which means that our medical facilities, the length and breadth of the country in remote areas, in small towns, in villages are being stretched. And under those circumstances, our deficits and the fact that we have not planned a durable response to the pandemic have become glaringly obvious. On this matter, there is very little to disagree with, with the technocracies of the union government or of the state governments. They are all agreed, and I think uh, reasonably so, that there needs to be a massive immediate ramping up of tertiary healthcare facilities, COVID hospitals basically, and that by one modality or another, oxygen supplies need to be acquired and distributed. Um, you know, we, we all tend to focus on how many megatons of uh, oxygen are needed and how many are available. Um, but I think in that, there is the danger of forgetting that in as large a country with as distributed uh, an epidemic as is currently going on, as India's COVID is, getting oxygen to the right place in time across the country is as critical as having the oxygen to supply in the first place. So I think that those are going to remain the critical issues. And I'm really, really um, distressed that um, complete red herrings, such as remdesivir for uh, treating seriously ill people, for which it has not been recommended by any authority ranging from state medical associations in India to the World Health Organization. And yet, we have people desperately looking for remdesivir because again, the signal has gone out from the union government that remdesivir is a, is a medicine of importance for this crisis stage of the epidemic, which has to be managed. And as a result, people are being given this implicit message that remdesivir is, is an important medicine for your loved ones who are seriously ill and battling for their lives in hospital. And that is leading in turn to black marketeering and over and above black marketeering to utterly petty party politicking. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Thank you.